Each week, Richard and Father Mark present a rigorous discussion of the Bible in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. Over 24,000 episodes are downloaded each month at no charge. Please consider marking your level of support with a one-time donation or by pledging a small amount per episode. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. When St. Paul contrasts tablets of stone with the human heart, or the letter inscribed in stone with the Spirit, or the Old Covenant with the New, Christians are quick to assume that the old is incomplete without the new, or worse, that the human heart is preferable to following the letter of the law. Strange how people convince themselves that God would inscribe a teaching and then say, oops, I never meant for you to actually read it or do it. Just get the gist so that Obi-Wan can teach you to reach out to me with the force. Then you can ignore the letter of my law and be free. That might work for a Hollywood screenplay embedded with product placements, but it has nothing to do with the Bible. Richard and I discuss 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 125 of the Bible as Literature podcast. Last week in the intro, we talked about the problem of giving feedback to your teacher. And I swear that when I gave that intro, I was not thinking about verse 1 of chapter 3. But just to prove to you that if you know Scripture, you know Scripture, I'm going to read chapter 3, verse 1. Richard, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some, letters of commendation to or from you? There are no words that make any difference in this situation. It's all action. Are you acting according to the teaching? No? Okay, then you get an F. It's really that simple. You are our letter, written in our hearts. As I said earlier, the Torah was inscribed on Mary's heart in Luke, and she didn't give her opinion about it. She didn't form her own word based on it. She pondered these things quietly in her heart. The people and how they act are a reflection on the teaching that's inscribed in Paul's heart. Paul is trying to teach... And if the teaching is going to be manifest, they have to act according to the teaching. The people need to follow this teaching for this to be a reality. So this letter written in our hearts is known and read by all men, according to Paul, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ. So when you receive the teaching, when you allow the teacher to inscribe it on your heart, meaning your seat of reason, when that teaching becomes the impulse that controls all of your behaviors you are as much a written word as the word written on the page that's the key if you do what scripture says you are allowing yourself to be written the way a word is written on the page but there is an author and you are not the author the message from christ this teaching of christ is the gospel We can't just talk about the gospel. We can't just say the gospel. The gospel has to be lived and actualized. So if people want to read the gospel, they have to see what you're doing. So you are this letter of Christ, written by Paul, cared for by us. In other words, you are cared for by your teacher, Paul, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. The spirit is what goes into the person that is manifested by people's actions, as I've talked about many times before. So if the teaching is on your heart, if it is inscribed in your brain, etched in your skull, then your actions are going to reflect it and it's going to show that the spirit of God is then acting in you. And this is imparted to you by the teaching given by 
Paul, and Paul's teaching is manifested in you, as well as Christ's teaching, if you're doing something other than submitting to and caring for others in your community and those around you, if you're doing anything other than that, Christ's teaching is not there. If they read you, they're not going to hear the gospel. Now, modern hearers will look at this contrast between tablets of stone and tablets of human hearts, and they'll immediately jump to, Paul is saying that we've evolved or that we're more precious than stones, and they'll distort that contrast in this metaphor. They'll distort it to self-justify egoism because they miss what Paul is saying. He's not saying that your heart is better than a tablet of stone per se. He's saying let's take a shortcut and instead of writing on stone, write directly on you. But you have to be like the stone and receive the inscription without amending it or changing it or distorting it. So you're being challenged here the way a scholar is challenged in the classroom to set yourself aside and submit. People read it like this. Oh, well, it's written in a book. We don't need that. I mean, books can't feel. Books can't experience. No, Paul is telling you, I don't want you to feel and I don't want you to experience. I want you to act the way I'm telling you to act without amending my instruction. The point of books in the ancient world was to memorize them. That's how you inscribe them on your heart. A good scholar in Paul's time could get a book, learn it overnight, hand the book back the next morning, and have the entire book memorized in their head. There are stories of scholars who could do this during this time. So this was a normal process. That you would read a book and then it would be in your head. You couldn't forget it. And he is not only expecting this of his people, he's expecting them also to live it out in their actions, that it's supposed to not just be on their hearts, but then manifested through their actions. People in our culture make fun of rot memorization. And this is the same culture in which our corporate executives can't find people to write computer software, except from what we call backwards cultures, where they still do rot memorization. What does that tell you about the human heart? We are entering a new dark age and we are the masters and the creators of our own suffering and our own folly. You have to form the human mind according to the external pressure of external knowledge and external wisdom. If you are just self-referential, you will die out. It's not rocket science. Such confidence we have through Christ toward God, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. In other words, as I was just saying, it can't come from you. It can't. If it comes from you, it's your own existential fantasy world. We know that reality in the created world is not as it is perceived by humans per se. And we know from science and from physics that individual humans perceive reality individually. The green trees I'm looking at might not look the same as the green trees that you're looking at. So things are much funkier than people imagine. But that's why all the more you have to submit to something outside of yourself because left to yourself, you will become some kind of mentally ill. Whether you are a suburbanite who is incapable of seeing the folly of your own actions or the destruction of your own children, or whether you're an alcoholic who doesn't realize they're getting drunk or that it's a problem, all these forms of self-deception come from turning inward and relying on your own experiences to shape your understanding of reality. You need data, and Paul is imposing the wisdom of God as data on his spiritual children. If you perform a good action, a godly action, then you have to ascribe it to the Spirit of God. And if you have the Spirit of God, you have to ascribe that to the person who gave that to you. And who gave that to you? Paul. So if the Corinthians perform any good action, they have to thank Paul for it. That's just how it goes. And you have to thank God for the ability to do that thing. Now, if they do the wrong thing, who do they have to thank? They have to thank themselves for doing that. So this is how it lines up. I tell this to my kids. They don't like a teacher. Ah, eh, the teacher doesn't like me. Ah, eh, the teacher gave me a bad grade. Did you learn something from that teacher? Well, yeah, but it, not. no thanks to him. I'm like, no, 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 no. Thanks to him. Thanks to him you learned something. Now, whether you like it or not, that's a different issue. 
one with which I'm not very interested. Which is why if there are any academics listening, especially deans of academic institutions, if you have a professor who consistently gets bad ratings from the students, it might be a good sign. I didn't say it is a good sign, but it might be a good sign. God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life, in other words, don't fall into the trap of saying, well, Father Mark, it's just a book, and we kind of got to get the message and then figure it out, and it's all so lovely, and blah, blah, blah. No. He's saying don't be self-righteous, because once the letter is inscribed, the point of its inscription is that you can't do it. So don't fall in the trap of thinking that you can do every letter as it's inscribed, because then you'll become a self-righteous Jew who keeps kosher but makes war with his neighbor. If the letter is inscribed in stone, it's still external to you. Once it's inscribed in your heart, now it's internal. You can only act upon that word if it's internal to you. If the word is written in Hebrew and you don't know Hebrew, great, the law is written. But how can you act accordingly? It's only once it's inscribed in you that you can act. If the letter kills, it's because you can't follow it. Because the letter is inscribed in stone. Once it's on your heart and its spirit guides you, then you can actually do what it says and then have the life that it offers you. So that when you're in a situation, when you see another person's sin, you do not, I repeat, you do not extract a morality from the letter of the law and impose it on your neighbor. You remember what you learned from the folly of your fathers in scripture, that you are guilty of far greater wickedness and you show mercy to the neighbor and you apply the judgment to yourself. Perform the next action that the spirit inspires you to do according to the letter inscribed in your heart by the spirit of Paul. And get over yourself. Because not only have you sinned, and not only was your mother a Hittite and your father a Philistine, not only, but you're going to sin again. You will fail again. So you need to accept the letter of the law that you are the failure and continue to give gratitude to God for his acceptance of you despite your failure by making every effort to do the commandments of God. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, as did the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, which puts you to death with the letter, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? And before we talk about the ministry of the Spirit, I want to point out that all of this nonsense about seeing God in various Christian traditions and beholding God and seeing the light of the resurrection goes against scripture because it's a marvel that Moses saw God and lived. That's why in the tradition he's called the God seer because nobody else can see God. When he did see the back of God, when God allowed it to happen, it was when he was on Sinai receiving Torah. And when he brought Torah back down to the people, this is when they're not able to look directly on his face because of the glory of beholding the teaching that came from God. The teaching that is then inscribed on the heart, not just the one externally on the tablet. How much more should this manifest this glory that's impossible to look upon? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, meaning, look, Moses received the law, the people could not fulfill the law but they had to follow it, and it still manifests God's glory in their failure. Much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. So just as God's glory was manifest in the failure of Israel, and is manifest in the failure of the church in Roman Corinth, how much more will God's glory be manifest in his ability to clothe the unrighteous with righteousness? He's not saying that the Christians in Roman Corinth are better than the Jews in Exodus. He's saying that God is going to crown the glory of death under the law with the glory of righteousness from the hand of God. He's going to honor them with his robe. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is 
glory. What was written in Torah and what came down by the hand of Moses was correct and it was able to give life. But it could not give life unless people actually did it. They had to actually commit it to their heart and perform it with their actions. So that law on the stone itself was so glorious because it was the way for people to have life. But it doesn't actually manifest that life until people do it. But now with Christ and the crucifixion and his own sacrifice, we're able to see what kind of glory that manifests when someone actually completely follows that teaching as it's inscribed on their heart. So he is then the ideal. Paul is then following Christ as the one who has now received this teaching. So what the people are supposed to see, the Gentiles, those outside of the church, are supposed to see when they see the Corinthians is a glory more glorious than the shine on Moses' face that was so shiny they weren't able to look at it. This is what they're supposed to see with the Corinthians. This is how the law written on their hearts is supposed to manifest itself. The Wachowski brothers got it correct in this regard, not with their neo-paganism and their pseudo-Hellenism and their Gnosticism, but on this specific point, that the human beings and the machines need each other. In other words, the people of Israel know that the Torah is supposed to give them life, but it cannot give them life if they are not in communion with their neighbor, and their neighbor can't just be their tribe. This is what Paul has been insisting upon all throughout this diptych of 1 and 2 Corinthians, that the life promised by the Torah comes from submission to the Torah in function of your neighbor, whatever or whoever your neighbor is. So if you cannot hold communion with people outside of Israel, you cannot fulfill the Torah. And so now the life that is promised is possible because finally we're including all of God's children. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. Christ shows what everyone was striving to do and failing at. Christ actually manifested the Torah. When the Torah was given to Moses, it was, here Israel, do this and you'll have life. And then what happened? The prophets say, by the way, you didn't follow this. You didn't follow this. You didn't follow this. You didn't follow this. Guess what? The Assyrians are knocking at the door. The locusts are eating up your crops. The Babylonians are now ready to finish off what the Assyrians left over. What that kept manifesting is that they were following another teaching, the teaching of Baal, as Hosea teaches. So what Jesus manifests is like, okay, Israel, if you actually do things correctly, this is what it's going to look like. And it's not glorious in the way that you think of glory in that now the Babylonians are smashed, the Romans are smashed, or whoever, but your will, the sickness in your soul that makes you incapable of being loyal to God, the Torah can cure that. But only if you commit that Torah to your heart so that your actions manifest that teaching. The way to think of the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament is very simple. The Old Testament is the lecture. The Old Testament is the content of the teaching. So you attend the lecture, the professor explains it, but you don't get it. There's a veil over your eyes. And so the professor assigns a graduate student to have a lab session during the week. And that's where you go and you explain that you don't understand T cells and CD4 and viruses and the teaching assistant explains it to you. He gives examples so that through the examples and the deeper discussion and the exploring of questions and answers, you can begin to understand the reference which was in the lecture presented by the professor. Right, and then when you get a D on the exam, you can say, but there's no way anyone could do well in that exam. That exam was impossible, and the professor says, well, actually, here's Muhammad over here. He got the A. He got an A. He seemed to have gotten it. And how did he do it? He listened, and he studied, and he memorized, and we didn't understand something. He came to office hours, and he asked me, and then he requested that I would offer an extra office hour so that I could 
teach him more. And then once he put the time into it and really dedicated himself to this, then he was actually able to manifest everything that I was trying to teach all of you. But unfortunately, only Muhammad got an A and all the rest of you got Ds and Fs. That's how it goes. If you had done what Muhammad did, yeah, you would have a chance of getting an A. I won't guarantee you would get an A. Muhammad's a pretty smart guy. But if you would dedicate yourself to really manifesting that this class is actually important to you, that you're not just jumping through a hoop so you get a good transcript so you can go and get the job of your dreams, show me that this is serious by acting as if this is serious and come to me to learn. And if you want to complain and say it's impossible, I've always got Muhammad who's going to show you you can do it just fine. Now, Muhammad, he doesn't go to parties. He doesn't have a lot of girlfriends. You know why? Because he's studying. He's working because he thinks this class is serious. So the glory that he gets is my appreciation of him. Now, the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, meaning that you have to submit to what is inscribed so that it can be inscribed on your heart so that it becomes a part of the way your heart functions. And then, only then, after you've memorized the whole Bible and drilled it into yourself and practiced it, will it eventually come natural to you so that you can go forward without instruction and act as though you are receiving instruction, meaning that you could become wise. That is the liberty and the folly of modern thinking is that you can have that liberty without first memorizing objective content and drilling yourself with objective content, and that's why we're falling apart. Using the analogy that we were talking about in the college classroom, the same thing I talk about with my kids. Ultimately, whose appreciation do you want? The guys at the frat house or the professor? Paul wants you to make that decision. Whose glory do you want? Because they're incompatible with each other. You cannot have both. And once you make that decision, now all of a sudden, that's when the veil is lifted from Moses' face because you can now look and understand what this glory is because you're willing to accept this Torah that is written on stone, bring it into your brain, and then act as if it's important to you. There are two kinds of people. There are people whose purpose is about themselves, their own lives, their own interests, and the most important part of their week is their garden and their trip to Home Depot. These make up the majority, and they are on the path to death scripturally. And there are those whose purpose is according to the scripture, katatas grafas, as Paul says. And they are on a mission sent by the Spirit of God into the world to accomplish that mission. And they operate as people who have a greater purpose. That's why the military is so beautiful. People who work for the military don't operate on their own behalf. They operate according to an instruction for the sake of a greater cause. There is a glory that is attributable to your garden and to the latest tool you got from Home Depot. And there is a glory that is attributable to the cross choose. This is what Paul is saying. The one glory fades away because it can't give life. So yes, you have a nice lawn, you have a beautiful garden, everybody's happy at home because you spend so much time taking care of your own needs. But in Minnesota, November is going to come and the lawn will be covered with snow and the garden will die. To what end? What is it that you're finding reward in? That's the question. But we all, with unveiled face, we who are on a mission sent by God, and you better believe we're bold, and we use great boldness in our speech, because we're not here on behalf of Home Depot's profit. We're here on behalf of the life of the world. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. And this harkens back to the beginning of the chapter where Paul teaches it's manifested in the people and so the mirror that Paul is looking at is I'm teaching is this teaching being reflected back at me by the actions of the people the judgment on the people is their compatibility with the gospel and their actions but if you understand that the well-being of your household and the upkeep of your home and the well-being of the people in your household is 
not the point of life. And you join your life to the real glory which comes from the Spirit of the Lord, then suddenly what you do in your own household has value. It only ceases to have value when it's not joined to the true glory, which is the well-being of your neighbor through the instruction of the Spirit. So Paul is saying that even though the life that you could receive under the law with Moses fades away, if you commend yourself now to the glory of the righteousness that is handed down by God who gives the grades in the classroom, then the first glory given to Moses was not to no end and to no purpose, and we are translated from glory to glory in Scripture. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.